communicate with your tenants. Be upfront and honest with them. Tell them the fact they probably already know, that their rent is below market rate. Advise them the rental rate will be increasing and any improvements you have planned for the property. If you'd like to keep a tenant who has met your qualifications, you can offer them an incremental rent increase. Work into the lease for increases every few months instead of all at one time. We did this recently on our Idaho properties. We closed on them in the month of August, and three of the four leases were coming up that following November. So instead of laying a couple hundred dollar increase on them right before the holidays, we offered them one increase when they signed the lease and another increase six months later. Why did we do this? At the time, the market was just starting to shift, and we were concerned that if they did move out and a few months later rates fell, then we would be left in a position of a vacant unit during the winter months and potentially having to get a lower rent. Welcome to your Landlord Resource Podcast. Many moons ago, when I started as a landlord, I was as green as it gets. I may have had my real estate license, but I lacked confidence and the hands-on experience needed when it came to dealing with tenants, leases, maintenance, and bookkeeping. After many failed attempts, fast forward to today, Kevin and I have doubled our doors and created an organized, professionally operated rental property business. Want to go from overwhelmed to confident? If you're an ambitious landlord or maybe one in the making, join us as we provide strategies and teach actionable steps to help you reach your goals and the lifestyle you desire, all while building a streamlined and profitable rental property business. This is your Landlord Resource Podcast. Hello there, landlords, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Stacy. I'm here with my partner in crime, Kevin. This is episode 11 of our podcast, and today we're discussing how to handle existing tenants, also known as inherited tenants, and they come with the purchase of a new rental property. In this episode, we're going to guide you on how to evaluate these tenants before you even place that offer, the processes you need to follow during your due diligence, and what's important to do with these new tenants once the sale or the purchase closes. So let's start with the fact that finding and purchasing a rental property is stressful. Yes, it is. Consider now that it often comes with tenants already in place, which is usually ideal, right? This means immediate cash flow, no downtime searching for the right renters to occupy your new property. And if the tenants have lived in the property long term, you have a limited risk of the property becoming vacant in the near future. Sometimes these tenants can make that purchase either really great or seriously disruptive. And while in a perfect world, you'd love to start with tenants you have screened and vetted yourself, unfortunately, you must honor the terms of their lease with the previous owner until expiration. So how do you handle the inherited tenants that came with your new investment? Let's start with what to do before you even make an offer. Typically, upon request, a seller or their broker will provide a disclosure package to prospective buyers to show the basic information that will help determine if the property is worth moving forward with an offer. This disclosure packet usually contains copies of the unit mix, rent rolls, and financial statements. If the numbers seem to work with your requirements after your review of these docs, you can ask for copies of the leases. Now, the seller does not have to provide these. However, if they have nothing to hide and you have proven you are a serious buyer, they should provide the leases. Keep in mind, it is likely that tenants' names will be blacked out to preserve their privacy. Yeah, we've had that. We've seen that before. All right. So getting accurate information regarding the occupied property and its tenants is vital and should be a priority even before you make that offer. In addition, When buying an investment property, you are responsible for taking over its existing leases because while a lease is a legal agreement between the tenants and a landlord, the lease does not dissipate with the sale of the property. Just like easements and other covenants that are considered to quote-unquote run with the land, the leases are tied to the property itself and not simply just the owner. This means that the lease stays attached to the property if you purchase and you will not be legally able to raise the rent, 
modify clauses, or kick a tenant out simply because you're the new owner. The only exceptions to this are instances where termed leases specify that the owner, in this case the seller, has the right to termination upon transferring the property, or if you are purchasing the property as a foreclosure, in which case you can refer to your state's regulations regarding notice to vacate. Therefore, as a purchaser, you must be familiar with all the conditions of the lease this tenant has with the person you're buying that property from. Very important. When reviewing the leases, you want to evaluate the following item. Confirm that the rent amount on the lease matches what the rent roll says. What are the lease terms? Are the tenants month to month? If not, when does the lease end? How much is the security deposit? Now pay attention to the number of occupants listed on the lease. Is it one person, a family? Do they have teens nearing the age of 18? Who's responsible for the utilities and expenses? Are there any special terms of the lease, such as rent credits or discounts for work performed? Are there special addendums, you know, pets, smoking, landscaping, special arrangements between owner and tenants, etc.? You can also ask to see the criteria the owners use to qualify the tenants. This can show you how they go about doing their background checks and how deep they go to verify that the information on the application is valid and truthful. You want to know, do they verify income with every renewal? Why is this important? Let's say there is a husband and wife in the unit, and one of them lost their high-paying job right before renewal. Even though the income from the other spouse allows them to pay the rent, do they still qualify to rent from you? What if you renew them without verifying their income and the other spouse loses their job? These are things you really need to think about as a DIY landlord. Now, should you find that all of the terms of the lease fit your business model, move ahead and make an offer. This doesn't mean you are definitely buying the property, but in order to get more information, you have to place an offer to show the owner you are serious and have intent. This is why the information you receive prior to the offer is minimal and just enough for you to see if this property will work within your portfolio of properties. All right, so let's assume they accepted your offer. Congratulations, and now the fun begins. Once the offer is accepted, the clock starts ticking for the buyer to perform their due diligence or, in simpler terms, an investigation of the current owner's property, their business practices, and the tenants. So along with physical inspection reports and appraisals, the buyer will want to obtain an estoppel certificate to gain confirmation from the tenant of the status of their existing lease. This is the primary way to confirm your inherited tenants and their leases will work with your new rental property. So what's an estoppel certificate? It's an easy form, usually one page, that the existing tenant fills out, giving you the conditions of their rental agreement to the very best of their knowledge. It's a legally binding document whereby a tenant represents or promises certain things regarding its lease and the rental agreement to be true. Therefore, confirming the rental agreement details with every tenant before buying the property is crucial. Its primary purpose is to verify cash flows. The certificate discloses the rent that the tenants say they pay. This is important to lenders, buyers, and tenants. For lenders, cash flow is critical for understanding whether a borrower can repay a loan. An owner seeking financing might overstate rent revenues or hide rent concessions. Before lenders undertake the risk of lending to this borrower, they must perform their own due diligence and verify cash flows. Accordingly, lenders check to see if the estoppel certificates reveal discrepancies between representations by the owner and the tenants. Naturally, these discrepancies could change the loan offer and even scuttle it. So not all lenders require these, but it is standard practice on loans of multifamily properties for a lender to condition approval upon receipt of all these tenant estoppel certificates. Now, they are important to buyers because the buyer of an occupied, rent-producing property must formulate an informed bid price. Typically, the cap rate is central to developing a bid based on the property's net income. Naturally, any misstatement of rent revenues distorts net income and could cause the buyer to overbid. These estoppel certificates, or ECs, are one form of a buyer's protection against a seller's misrepresentation 
or mistakes. Let's talk about the guy stuck in the middle, the tenant. They can use this form to indicate any special understandings they have with the landlord. Estoppel certificates also give the tenants the opportunity to explain any claims they have against the landlord. Buyers and lenders may change their attitude towards proposed transactions due to this kind of information. The purpose of the EC is usually twofold. First, it gives a prospective purchaser accurate information about the lease and the leased premises. Secondly, it gives assurance to the purchase that the tenant, at a later date, will not make claims that are inconsistent with the statements contained in the estoppel certificate. Yeah, they, they're super important. And such claims may be oral agreements that are made between the tenant and the owner, like a discount on the rent to perform maintenance like landscaping. So we have a tenant, which we credit $25 a month to roll the recycling and the compost trash bins out to the curb each week. We have written this as an addendum in our lease, but many landlords could view this as minimal and accept it with just a verbal or handshake deal. So notice how I said credit back on the lease and not the word discount. A credit is written like a payment that we offer him, not a deduction in the rental rate. And our addendum clearly states that his rental rate is X and the fee we pay him for the service is $25, which we allow him to deduct from his rent. This way, if we go to sell the building, we do not have to show the rent as $25 less. If we did, the adjusted rental rate can affect financing in the rent roll provided with the sale. We simply show that we pay this tenant $25 to perform a service, and instead of issuing him a check each month, we have agreed he can pay $25 less on his rent. It seems like the same thing, but it's not. When we invoice the tenant each month, the rental rate is what is noted on the lease. And then there's a separate line item with that $25 that is expensed against maintenance. A new owner could very simply tell this tenant they're not going to pay them for the service and the tenant would have to go back to paying that rent in full. And I know that $25 doesn't seem like a lot of money, but imagine if they are giving a $200 credit for handling maintenance or, or doing something else, maybe on a different property for that, for that landlord. Yeah, it makes a big difference. All right, let's get back to the estoppel certificate. The landlord, the current owner, usually always handles getting the EC because they likely need them to sell or refinance the property. If the property owner does not provide you with the estoppel certificate, you can request to collect them yourself. This will allow you to set up an appointment and meet each tenant one-on-one. -on -one. Should the property owner not enable you to interview the tenants and receive the EC, this could be a red flag, and they may be attempting to hide something. This situation is relatively rare, though. Now, a tenant can refuse to sign an estoppel agreement, but that would not be in their best interest. Some leases say they do have to sign, and if they refuse, it can be grounds for eviction. Some leases, we see you here, San Francisco, have clauses in them that do not require the tenant to sign an estoppel agreement. For the most part, this leaves the landlord to complete it, and if they make an error, then that tenant is stuck with the terms on the EC. A crucial error here could be the end date of the lease. What if the landlord confused the end date between their unit and another, and it ended sooner, or extended it much longer than the tenant needed? By not verifying the information and signing it, this can really screw the tenant and you as the buyer, if the information is a negative against you. If buying a property, when you hoped to increase the rent with the renewal, the wrong end date of a lease might allow a tenant more months at that lower rate. Yeah, and you have to keep in mind that estoppel certificates are not used in all states. When we bought our fourplex in Idaho, they looked at us like we were nuts and told us that they didn't require them and nobody used us. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Oh my God, I thought I was, I was, I thought I was losing it. However, we were able to meet the property manager and the tenants to discuss and get any information that we needed, so everything worked out fine. So if we were to use an estoppel certificate, what would it include? At minimum, you want to see all tenants and occupant names, lease terms, including the start and the end date, rent amount and the due date, security deposit amount that has been paid, the utility arrangement, so who pays for what, appliances, 
who owns them, who has to maintain them. If applicable, pet addendum information, like is there additional rent or security deposit paid for the pet or are there limitations on size or breed. Current maintenance lists, if there is one, and any other addendums like for no smoking or landscaping, things like that. If you get to meet the tenants in person, remember, the property is an investment, but it's also their home. If the current owner has open lines of communication, the tenants are probably aware of an impending change of ownership. Besides the stress you feel with the purchase of the rental property, your potential inherited tenant also feels uneasy, mainly from fear of the unknown. One way which is our preferred method, is to start the relationship out on a positive note. When asking them to fill out the estoppel certificate, maybe let them know about a few of the improvements you're considering making on the property. Speaking directly with the tenants can give you detailed information about how well, or not, the rental unit is currently being managed. Conversely, if you definitely want the tenants to move out, you have a couple options. One is to submit an offer on the house that is contingent on the home being vacant that is, no tenants, when you close on the property. This puts the burden on the seller to either break the lease or offer an incentive to the tenants to leave early. If the tenant is unable or unwilling to do this, you can walk away and start looking for other rental property. The other option is to go through with the sale and try to remove the tenant with an option called cash for keys. We'll discuss this more in a minute. One last thing you want to do before you close is to be sure the seller provides documentation regarding the condition of the property before the tenant moved in. If there's damage, you'll have a hard time proving the tenant is responsible without a check-in report. Yep, and those checklists are super important. We use them all the time. So it's good that if we're going to sell our property, we have all of that in the tenant's file to be able to provide to a new owner. All right, let's switch gears and talk about what happens after purchasing your new rental property. Once the purchase is complete, deliver a change of management notice to the tenant. This document informs the inherited tenant about new contact information, how and where they pay the rent, and how to report a maintenance issue. It also asks the tenant to update their banking information to the correct owner's name should they pay via EFT. Convey to them that you are a person who takes pride in your rental properties and let them know that communication is vital to you. Advise them that your job is to ensure the property is in good condition moving forward and your tenants have a safe, clean, and quiet place that they can call home. And here's a tip. Never agree or speak in a manner that makes a tenant feel like you're going to keep them on or renew their lease automatically. Should their lease expire and they do not meet your rental criteria, you have the right to not renew that lease. Of course, except in some rent-controlled areas. Keep the conversation neutral and businesslike and explain that you will be reevaluating each tenant before signing any new leases. There are some roadblocks that can occur with existing tenants. You may find the current occupants are dream tenants, but they are unprepared to continue to occupy the rental under a new landlord. The sale of a property is a big change for a tenant, and if your new tenants have lived there long term, they have likely settled and become comfortable with the current rent price and lease allowances. If the previous landlords were not increasing the rent yearly or were not performing regular seasonal inspections, you may find that your new tenants balk at the changes you make to protect your investment. Unfortunately, inheriting existing tenants means you are forced to rely on the previous landlord's tenant screening process, which really may be lacking. The seller could have accepted any applicant, regardless of qualifications, simply to list the investment property as occupied. Or they may have a long-term tenant who simply refuses to pay the rent on time or at all. Buyers beware. A landlord could simply be selling their property to offload the problem tenants onto an unsuspecting investor. If their lease is month to month or expired, it is good to have inherited tenants fill out your standard application and screen them as you would a prospective new tenant. Yeah, you basically want to start the process over and qualify these tenants based on your own criteria. You should already have your policies and standards set. Tenant screening is vital to ensuring that your investment is protected. Bad tenants can create havoc through unpaid rent, property damage, and draw out eviction cases. Now, if you need help with this, we have a free 10-page guide on placing your ideal tenant. It covers tips on setting policies and criteria, 
marketing your unit, how to vet an applicant, pointers for setting up your lease, and processing the move-in walkthrough. We will put a link in our show notes, or you can go to yourlandlordresource.com forward slash landlord guide. That's yourlandlordresource.com forward slash landlord guide. Landlord guide is all one word. All right. Now, legally, you must honor the conditions of the existing leases. We've said this a couple times already. You may not like those conditions, but you're lawfully bound to abide by the lease until that expiration date. However, if the tenant agrees, you can ask them to sign an updated lease with you before their previous lease ends. Your new lease would replace the old lease, making it null and void. Conversely, if you want to remove an unwanted tenant, you might consider using the method cash for keys that Kevin had mentioned earlier. If their lease doesn't expire for some time and you have found they have violated the lease significantly, you can approach them and offer them a set amount of money to move out. This is also a way to remove a tenant should you want to do a significant remodel or move into the unit yourself and not have to wait until the lease ends. Typically, this amount is enough funds to cover moving expenses, a security deposit on another rental, and a little extra for the inconvenience that you're causing. If they have lease violations and decline your cash offer, you can explain how that offer is instead of the costly eviction process which you're going to proceed with given those lease violations. Now, this concept is all fine and dandy in most states, but if you're in a rent-controlled state, the tenants have rights before evicting. As always, we recommend you know your laws before proceeding. This means if you purchase a property with a plan of getting a tenant out, you better know the landlord-tenant law before you purchase, or you might be stuck with them for a while. If their lease expires in 90 days or less, give the proper legal notice that you will be ending their tenancy. Again, of course, being mindful of whether your rent-controlled state allows this. What if you want to increase rents on your new rental property? The best case scenario is if a current tenant meets all your qualifications and you want to continue to have them as a tenant. If there is going to be a rent increase, be sure that the property maintenance is current, the increase is reasonable, proper notice is given, and all lines of communication are open. Usually when buying a rental property, You will need to have the rents at or near market rate to make your investment work. Here's a tip. When raising rents, keep them just below the market rate. Why? Because when your tenants research moving, they'll find other rental costs similar to what they are paying now or more. And the hassle of moving isn't worth it. Plus, having to come up with a security deposit for a new place before moving out of your old might be a burden to them. Make it easy for them to stay. Right. We do that all the time. So think about this. Should you raise your rents immediately or is it better to do it over time? Once again, communicate with your tenants. Be upfront and honest with them. Tell them the fact they probably already know, that their rent is below market rate. Advise them the rental rate will be increasing and any improvements you have planned for the property. If you'd like to keep a tenant who has met your qualifications, you can offer them an incremental rent increase. Work into the lease for increases every few months instead of all at one time. We did this recently on our Idaho properties. We closed on them in the month of August, and three of the four leases were coming up that following November. So instead of laying a couple hundred dollar increase on them right before the holidays, we offered them one increase when they signed the lease and another increase six months later. Why did we do this? At the time, the market was just starting to shift, and we were concerned that if they did move out and a few months later rates fell, then we would be left in a position of a vacant unit during the winter months and potentially having to get a lower rent. Also, as a sign of good faith, we offer them something so they feel like they're getting a deal in return. An incentive like buy them a new refrigerator, replace the carpet, paint a room, update the unit with efficient lighting, or offer something that adds value specifically to your unit. Giving other things like Amazon cards or TVs are not an ideal way to sway a tenant. You can only write off $25 a year in gifts, so those don't help your bottom line, whereas doing improvements can. Plus, you likely need to make that improvement anyway. This just makes a tenant feel valued, and all the while you're getting planned maintenance done on the unit. We have done this a lot, and it really makes a difference with the renewal rates. Yeah, that's right. I We just did this in Sacramento last year, yep. right? Yes, we did. These units fall under state rent control, so we are allowed to increase rents 
by around 8 to 9 percent in a 12-month period. Statewide, it's 5 percent plus the CPI. This particular tenant is great. He looks out for the complex, he keeps his unit clean and tidy, and he even pays his rent two weeks early every single month. Yeah, that's a nice, nice, <laughs> the nice best. perk. Through conversation, we found out he was looking for a better paying job. Now, what kind of landlord would we be to say, hey, great, you're making more money. We'll take some of that. Thank you. <laughs> no. So what we did was had his increases come in two segments, six months apart. He knew he couldn't find a unit with all the amenities we offer at the first rate we offered, which was just below market. So he agreed. Could we have done the whole increase at once? Legally, yes. But for us, we valued this tenant and wanted to keep the relationship good. For all we know, we could have increased his rent, and he said, nope, moving out. Then we would have been stuck with a vacant unit that needs work. This was not a time to be greedy. Additionally, when his lease expires, we can increase it based on the most recent rental rate, which is a few percentage points higher than the first one. Do what you need to do to keep a good tenant in your unit if the situation warrants it. Not only does it keep your income steady, but it is also appreciated by the tenants. They know you care about them as people and not just as an income source. Ultimately, the goal of every landlord is to fill every unit with excellent tenants. The risk of inherited tenants with your new rental property is that you, the new landlord, did not select them. On the other hand, you could inherit some excellent tenants who want to stay a really long time, and communication is always key. The ability to start your relationship with your inherited tenants in a positive way will significantly depend on your ability to communicate clearly and openly. The more they know, like, and trust you, the higher chance of a smooth transition and welcomed outcome for everyone. So that's our episode about how to handle inherited tenants that come with your new rental property. We appreciate you tuning in and listening and hope you have learned a little something from us today. If you would click that subscribe or follow button on your favorite podcast platform and share our podcast with other rental property owners, it really helps boost us up in the charts and reach other DIY landlords as yourself. We're doing what we can to guide all of you to an organized, professional, and streamlined rental property business. And if you would like to receive a link to our podcast in your email each week, you can subscribe to our free newsletter, Landlord Weekly. It comes out every Tuesday and includes all kinds of tips, early access to our blogs, landlord-specific articles written by other industry pros, our favorite landlord products that we use in our business, and the most recent link to this podcast. You can subscribe at yourlandlordresource.com forward slash subscribe. That's yourlandlordresource.com forward slash subscribe. We will also include a link to subscribe in the show notes. Thanks again for joining us. I'm Stacy, signing off with Kevin. Hang in there. You got this, landlords. 